Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of A God Shift Podcast with Shana Rattler. I am your host, Shana Rattler, and I am glad that you are here. So as we do at the beginning of every single one of these episodes, I have a favor to ask of you. So where you are listening to this podcast, whether it is on your phone or your tablet or your computer or wherever you consume your content, I would love if you would take a screenshot of this episode and post it on your social media with your biggest takeaway. And when you do that, if you would tag us here at a God shift, I would appreciate it. It helps us just to get the message um, of hope and overcoming disruption and getting into destiny into the hands of more people who need it. So if you would do that, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. So we're going to jump right to it because we've got a great guest here today. And I want to read his bio so that we can get straight into the information that he is going to share with us. We're going to talk a little bit about what has happened in his life in the form of disruption, and then we're also going to share some tips of how we believe that you all can overcome similar situations when you found yourself in the middle of disruption. So here we go. I am going to read his bio as soon as it comes up. Here we go. Rich Lewis is an author, speaker, and coach who focuses on centering prayer as a means of inner transformation. He teaches centering prayer in both his local and virtual community and offers one-on-one coaching. He publishes a weekly meditation, book reviews, and interviews on his site, Silence Teaches. He has published articles for a number of organizations, including Contemplative Light, Abbey of the Arts, Contemplative Outreach, Erd Word, In Search of a New Eden, The Ordinary Mystic at Pathios, and The Contemplative Writer. Rich has been a daily practitioner of Centering Prayer since June 1st, 2014. Centering Prayer has been so life-giving and life-changing that he feels compelled to share his journey with others who wish to learn more. Rich resides with his family in Ambler, Pennsylvania. Learn more about him at silenceteaches.com. Welcome to the show, Rich Lewis. Great. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. How are you doing today, Rich? I'm good. I'm very good. Awesome. Well, I'm glad you're here. So let's start off. You know, obviously I read your bio um, and the bio is always full of, you know, fancy superlatives and things of that nature. But in your own words, just give us the 20 or 30 second part of who you are and how you show up in the world. Um. I guess centering prayer has been so, I'll just say it's been so transforming and healing to me that I simply want to share it with others in case it can help them. I mean, there's many different contemplative paths, but it's worked well for me and healed me, transformed me over the last six, seven years. And I simply want to share it with others just in case it can do the same for them. Yeah. And that's why I do this podcast as well. You know, it's not just about, you know, highlighting people's stories, but we know that people's lives in the world today are so full of many unfortunate circumstances and some good circumstances that still take us by storm. And I just believe it's important for us to be able to allow an opportunity for people to know that there is hope on the other side of whatever it is that you are going through. So it sounds like we're um, kindred spirits in regards to our mission. I, I like that. So this is the God Shift podcast. And my definition of a podcast is that anytime a disruption in your life collides with God's purpose and ultimately gets you into a greater destiny. So Rich, can you share a time from your life where you've had some form of disruption, whether it was a setback or a delay or a denial or some form of challenge that you can think of? Sure. No, I would, I would say I had a God shift back in 20, I guess, beginning of 20, 20, 2009, uh, 2008, where it forced me and my wife to make some decisions in terms of one of us needed to stay home and be more of a caretaker for a family member just to get that person through the help and support that they needed. So we both spoke and I left um, where I was working. I'd been there for 20 years. So it was a tough decision. And I left to be a stay at home dad and and be the caretaker, be involved um, to help with the situation. Um, Now I have since actually returned to the workforce two and a half years after that, I actually was able to return back to the same company that I was working at. Right. But it was definitely a God shift moment because it really tested me um, during that time um, where I, I guess I lost a sense of my identity and you should never put your identity in your work. But I think I lost my sense of identity. I went into a depression as a result. And then we even had some pretty uh, harsh financial stress because our decision backfired. Well, I guess I wouldn't say it backfired, but we it, we, it created 
a lot of financial stress for us. But we came out of it, I guess, at the other end, much stronger and different. So I, I would say the God shift moment, even though at the time was not pleasant, we, ne we needed to go through it and we're glad we did. And we came out better uh, on the other end of it. Absolutely. And, you know, I like the fact that you call it a test, right? Because it's so often, you know, when God is using circumstances, it really is a test. You know, it's not just to take us through something for the sake of taking it through us. But I believe that he has something so great for us on the other side of where we are right now or what it is that we're doing in our lives. There was a lady that I interviewed about a week ago and she was like, I really thought I was in my purpose until the disruption came along to get my attention to show me that I was needed somewhere, you know, somewhere else. And so sometimes I believe that when we go through trials and tribulations, that it really is a test because he's like, listen, I know what I have for him and her down the road. Let me just test them now to see how much they will persevere, see how much they are really ready um, and willing to go where it is that I need them next. So when you think about that test, what do you think that he was either, either well, two things. One, why did he have to use that particular test to get your attention? And what is it that you think that he was trying to get you to learn from that? Um, why did he have to do that? And what did we learn? Um, well, I can tell you what I learned, and then I'll come back to the other part. Okay. So I, mean, I think we definitely learned, um, and my wife probably was there, she was a little bit further along than me, because um, she was more of a rock, I, I needed to better learn to trust God. Mm -hmm. and, and my wife had, had stronger, was more of a rock in that area. Um, and, and I needed to learn that money shouldn't be the focus, that it was important to save have regular savings and save in our 401k, but that really wasn't the main focus in life and that God would provide the money that we need. Um, so I needed to focus on God. I needed to better listen to God and then go where God was telling me to go. And I, so I think as a result of it, I discovered, you know, the power of silence and centering prayer and sitting with God, which came many years later, but I think this set me up for discovering God and sitting with God and trusting God. And then what was the other, the first question that I said, now I'll come back to. <laughs> well, no, I was, just, I was just curious. I believe that anytime we experience a form of disruption, that it's an invitation, right? And so it, it, he's trying to get our attention. And usually it's because there's something that he needs us to see, something that he needs us to learn or somewhere different he needs us to go. And so I was just curious, why do you feel like he needed to use this circumstance in order to get your attention? Um. I guess he really just wanted us, me to trust him. And, and the only way to trust him was that it, that was all we, I had to do at that time was if, if we were, you know, if, if I had lost my identity and I, had, and, and if we were financially struggling, the only thing left was, was God. And, and I needed to trust God, not trust my job, not trust money, um, but, and, and any money coming in, but just trust God to hold us and sustain us and show us the way forward. Yeah, I like that. I, I believe the same thing, you know, that oftentimes we have to be stripped away of some of the things that we have found comfort in, some of the things that we may, dare I say, even have made I, idols or, or gods out of them. And he's like, okay, well, let me allow you the things that you think you need. Let me take those things away. So all you have is me. And then when you realize that you still made it, you'll realize all you ever needed was me to begin with. And hopefully you don't find yourself back, you know, in, in, in those, in those pitfalls again. So how did you respond? Um, at the time, obviously I didn't respond well, <laughs> so it took me a couple of years. So I, obviously, as I said, at the time, I think I lost my sense of identity because I put my identity in my work. Um, and then I kind of went into a depression and wasn't helpful for my wife and where she all of a sudden had, had to, you know, work, deal with me and my depression and, and my lack of motivation to do things. So I guess initially I didn't respond well, but then I guess I began reaching, talking to my wife and, and reaching out to, and I stopped talking to people and that's not good where I just isolated myself from friends and, and wasn't seeing people and, and wasn't responding to people. But I guess it was probably my mother who, who said, you, you need to do something. And she said, you need to go to your primary care physician and you need to talk to your, your doctor about this. So that's, so I listened, I guess I listened to my mother, <laughs> went to the doctor, told him what, how I was feeling. And I'm not embarrassed to say this. I temporarily got put on an antidepressant um, because, and, and an anxiety medicine because I needed that to get me through. Um, and then once I began feeling better and started moving, 
I came off the medicines. I mean, that was actually almost 10, 10 plus years ago since I've been on any of these medicines. But so I guess that's how I responded. I, I, I finally realized I can't isolate myself. And my mother was saying, go to the doctor, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. And, and I finally did. And, and that, then I slowly started coming out of my hole and moving and doing things. And then I ended up going, getting back in the workforce as well. Awesome. So let's unpack that a little bit before we go a different direction, because I have spoken to many believers that frown upon getting natural counseling, that frown upon using any type of medication for, you know, I'm just going to say mental illness for, you know, for a, a general terminology, because they believe or they've been taught that all you need is Jesus. All you need to do is go to Jesus. So my personal belief is, yes, God is God all by himself, but there's people that he put in the earth to be able to help you with things that you're going through. There are medicines that he put in the earth to be able to help you with things that you're going through. So talk a little bit about that, about why it's important, even when you're a believer, even when you do trust God and you trust his promises and his processes, why, why sometimes you do still need to go to doctors and why sometimes you do still need to be willing to get help through medication. Um, I mean, some of it, a lot of what you've said, I mean, I think God created different people with different skill sets so that we have primary care physicians and psychiatrists and, and, and psychologists. And these are, are all different people that are highly skilled in, in different areas. And uh, God wants us to take advantage of them or utilize them, you know, where, where needed. So, I, and, and I, as I think about back to that time, I probably, I probably had, I had, didn't have much faith and trust in God. Um, so that wouldn't have worked because I wasn't listening to God. And maybe I did listen to God. Maybe God was the one that nudged my maybe mother to, to tell me. Mother, right? So he probably spoke through my mother to say, you, I need to get you up. I need you to get you out of the house. I need to get you to a primary care physician and just have a regular physical. And then also just talk to the doctor and, and, and have a medical, <laughs> yeah. mental physical as well. And so, um, Oh, I, I guess a, a lot, a lot of that. I mean, I guess since then I've, I've had a lot of struggles in life since then, but um, I, I think it's my trust in God and my center in prayer practice has helped me get through them um, without a need for, for medicines. But no, I strongly, I, I encourage people, if you have a serious challenges or serious, serious trauma and, and it's, and you can't get through it, then you, you do need additional help, whether it's therapy or whether it's some type of short, even a short-term uh, medicine, it's very much needed. And then there's some people that have long-term medicine where they, they have their chemicals in their brains that are not um, balanced correctly, for, for lack of a better way of saying it. And they need the medicines to keep their chemicals in balance so that they're, they're stable and happy. <laughs> yeah, the, the bottom line is, Getting the help that you need means that there's something right with you. It doesn't mean that right. there's something, something wrong with you. Get whatever help it is that you need. Some people, all you need is prayer. But some of us, we're not there yet. And you need to talk to somebody and you need to pop those pills, whatever it is that you need to do. And a lot of people, like I said, they frown upon um, doing those things. And it could be largely because of the stigma um, you know, that is associated with it. But at the end of the day, if there's someone out there or there's something out there that can help you cope and can help you get to a better place, it's important to do that. And God will start you where you are. Like you said, you were in a season of your life where you didn't necessarily have full reliance and trust on him. You weren't, maybe you weren't even going to him, or if you were, you weren't listening to him. So he had to start you where you were and go, well, he will listen to his mother. So let me tap his mom so she can tap him. <laughs> I love You're it. right. I mean, I think it's exactly, that's exactly what he did. <laughs> I love it. So we're going to pause for a quick break, and then we are going to go um, a little bit of a different a different direction because you are an expert in your own right of, of helping people um, get through times of their life and using different mechanisms to do so. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, and we're going to share some tips with the listeners of how they can do exactly what you did, found themselves in a rough time, and, and get to a better place. This episode is brought to you by the free guide, When God Says Shift. Inside, you'll discover the four shifts required to follow God's plan to move you out of disruption and into a greater destiny, expectancy, and possibility. Head to godsaysshift.com to access it now. 
All right, welcome back. So you have been listening to myself and my guest, Rich Lewis. And before the break, we were talking about how Rick overcame his own form of disruption in his life and got to his next level of destiny. So Rich, before we get into sharing some tips with the listeners of how they can overcome similar situations, talk a little bit more um, about the professional work that it is that you do. Sure. So I um, have a website devoted to centering prayer, which really is two things. It's meditation, but it's also considered a relationship with God, because during centering prayer, you you sit silently with God and open to the presence and actions of God within. And do you want me to just give a quick, like quick history of centering prayer and then how you do it? That, a- I think that- absolutely. And then we'll get into, you know, sharing some tips with people. Sure. So Centering Prayer uh, was created in the early 1970s by three Trappist monks, of three Catholic priests. They saw other forms of meditation going on, and they wanted something more for the Christian community. So um, one of the monks, Father William Manager, was reading a 14th century classic book called The Cloud of Unknowing. And as he read it, it kind of a, a silent prayer practice jumped out of the pages to him that he then shared with the other priests. And then they began um, teaching it to clergy and priests and then and, and lay people and, and, and rolling it out to the public. And then they created in 1984, the Contemplative Outreach Organization, which has a website called contemplativeoutreach.org. And that's really the main centering prayer group. So a ton of resources is on centering prayer where you can find groups that practice all throughout the US and the various states as well as internationally. So that's kind of a short history of Centering Prayer. It's, 50, it's been around for 50 years, and, and Contemplative Outreach is really the main organization, um, international organization. And then how you do the practice is, to begin it, you sit comfortably with your eyes closed, and then interiorly, you introduce what's called a sacred word, usually of one or two syllables. So that could be God, love, Jesus, a color. And that signifies you're sitting with God and you're opening to the presence and actions of God within. And then as you begin engaging your thoughts, and what I mean by that is if you start begin thinking about everything you did before you sit or you begin planning your afternoon or what you're going to do after you sit, you realize you're no longer sitting with God. You're sitting with your, your thoughts and your planning and your plotting. So you reintroduce that word, sacred word, interiorly just to come back to the present and the purpose of your sit, which is to sit with God and to let go of all these thoughts and emotions and just sit with God and leave not, really – empty the barriers between you and God. It's just a silent sit with you and God. And I believe that, you know, during this time, God is praying in us the actions we are to take or the things that God knows we need, whether that's, you know, peace or calm or wisdom for tasks or nudges to get out of our comfort zone and try and do new things. So that's what I believe. I think of it as reverse prayer. I'm getting out of the way and I'm letting God pray and act in me during this time. So that's how you do the the silent sit. I love that because I read something one time and it was saying, you know, prayer is not just you talking. Sometimes prayer is you shutting up and letting God talk. So this is like, I like how you describe the word of like reverse prayers. Like this is time for you to be silent so you can actually, so you can actually hear. I love that. And we're going to talk more at the end about where people can find out more um, about this and about how they can reach you and what it is. Um, how they can work work with you potentially. So in your experience, you know, in helping, so let me, let me ask this, what would you say is the biggest benefit of using this silent time or using this centering prayer? What's the biggest result or outcome that someone could expect by adopting this practice in their life? Um, basically, you're deepening your relationship with God. So I'm, it's one way to pray. There's you know, If you think about it, you, it's, like a, it's kind of a path, to, a deep path of prayer, because you can think of prayer as vocal prayer, and you're talking to God or, or asking God for things or praying for others verbally. And then as you continue on the prayer path, you can think of meditative prayer. Maybe, maybe you're reading scripture and you're meditating on it saying, what do you want me to learn from this God? And then you're going deeper with God. And then this is sort of even a deeper even deeper than that, where you're just sitting with God, you're not talking to God, you're not meditating on, on any scripture, you're just simply sitting with God, and, and letting God pray and act in you and getting out of the way with all of your thoughts and emotions. So yeah. it can be very healing, it can be very transforming, it connects you to your true self, the person God wants you to be, 
and the action God wants you to take. Because if you think about it, you, all the letting go you do in centering prayer of all your thoughts and emotions and planning and plotting, you're getting all that out of the way. And then you're connecting to, to God at your deepest self and your true self at God. And then you begin, you're better able to listen to what does God want you to do? What are the steps and actions God wants you to take? Um, and on some of the things you're letting go of are fears. Like, I'm, I'm afraid to try this. Well, let go of it. And God said, you, we got this together. You're not, you're not doing it alone. So yeah. it, it can be very healing and very transforming. And it connects you to your true self, the person God wants you to be, which is a journey, never an end point. So it, it's while we're on this earth, it's a journey. And that, that's, so that's what it does. It's healing, transforming, and connects you to your true self journey. I'm just taking notes because all this sure. is so because what happens in centering prayer, it's, it's, they, they refer to it as divine therapy. Like you, you're letting go of all these thoughts and emotions you hold on to, and some of them are, are harmful to you. And you're letting go of tension in your body, uh, repressed, you know, tension in, your, we all hold tension in our necks and shoulders and stomach. So at each time we sit with God, we're releasing tension in our body. We're releasing these thoughts and we're releasing repressed thoughts. And, and it's really true freedom just to get rid of the garbage, I'll call garbage of a lifetime. Um, so it is divine therapy it is something to think about. And then you're connecting yeah. to your true self. I love it. So I read in your bio that you do a lot of writing, but you also do some one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. So I can imagine during your time of working with individuals, teaching them how to you know, practice this so that they can heal and transform their lives and all the benefits of this. So in your experience of doing this type of work, how do you believe, it, it, let me ask it this way. How can disruption, when, and, and again, disruption doesn't always have to be negative. I think that's the disruption that we usually um, pay the most attention to and maybe give the most effort to. But in your experience, how can the things that we're going through actually end up being beneficial to our lives? I would say it puts your will and God's will in direct alignment and you're living from your, your true self. So that's exactly what Centering Prayer does for me and, and it does for people that I speak with because you're getting yourself out of the way. Your will and God's will blend together or in alignment and you're living from your true self, the person God wants you to be, you know, not the person you think you should be. Yeah, that, that's so good. I love that. It, ca it causes your will and God's will to be in direct alignment. I, um, a couple of months ago, I was, was watching something on Instagram that one of my mentors does. And she was saying that she felt like spiritual alignment was really the key that unlocks everything that we're going through and gets us into everywhere we need to be. And so I, I, I like that it causes your will and God's will to become in direct alignment. That's good. So I think a lot of things sound good in theory, right? Um, you know, you can share your story of how you've done things. I can share my story of how I've done things. We can share, um, you know, different ways to do things, but there still can always be things that can get in the way of us shifting. There can always be things that can get in the way of this journey that we're on. You said it's never a period, you know, it's always, you know, constantly evolving. So in your experience, what are some of those common barriers that can actually get in the way when someone finds themselves on this journey? Um, well, one is fear. I mean, you're, you're, you're just fear change or, or you, you fear the unknown or fear doing something new that you've never done. Um, lack of trust in, in God as you move into new areas that you've, ne you've never done before. And um, the third one was popping in my head. Now I'm losing it. Fear, lack of trust, and <laughs> I should have written it down. It'll come um, back. Oh, when listening to kind of your interior voices. So definitely fear because people are afraid to try and do new things. In many cases, people don't at times, including myself, trust God as yeah. you're moving into new, into new territory. And then just listening to the interior voices in our heads that just tell us all kinds of things. I'm too young to try that. I'm too old to try that. I don't have the right skill set. Who am I to think I should be doing this? So we listen to all, or, or even our, you know, our friends or community can tell us things and we begin listening to them. And that's not even the right voice to listen to. So even just listening to all these interior voices 
and then never moving forward when it was God saying, I got, but why are you, <laughs> listen to me, you know, listen to all these voices. Yeah. So th those three are, I think, are big, big areas that we tend to, they're barriers and stop us sometimes dead in our tracks from moving forward. Exactly, exactly. Fear is always, you know, at the top of most people's list. And I do believe that, that some amount of fear is, is normal. Mm -hmm. Even sometimes some amount of fear can be healthy and helpful. It's when we allow it to really become a speed, you know, a, a roadblock that it, you know, that it's, that it becomes a, a negative trait in our lives. Well, this, you know, this concept of, of centering prayer is, is just mind blowing to me because I hear people talk about um, meditation a lot. I know that, you know, in the word, it tells us that we should meditate on the word of God, you know, day, day and night, but there's a lot of, um, people and practices that are actually teaching meditation in a way that can be harmful to you. You know, meditation, if you're doing it God's way, meditation in, in the way that he intended it to be, it is not some of the other practices that are out there right now. I won't go, you know, in, into too much of that, but I love the way that you are describing the way that you should meditate and the way that you should center yourself and really just giving people the practical tools of like, here's the word that you center on, whatever the case may be. So I really want people to find you. I want people to follow you. I want people to work with you because I, I, I believe in the power of what it is that that you are teaching and um i, I need I, I need the right stuff to get in the hands <laughs> of, of, of more people because lord knows there's enough out there that is that is leading people astray and is deceiving them into thinking that they're doing something positive in their lives and i really believe that it's just opening opening them up for more damage so how can our listeners find you like if they wanted to work with you personally um if they wanted to follow you on social media how can they find you Sure. The best place is my website, silenceteaches.com. If, and when they subscribe, they'll get my free, it's a free short ebook on centering prayer, which just teaches, you know, what it is and, and how you do it. And then if they want to further explore I, my book, you know, sitting with God, a journey to your true self through centering prayer came out in August of 2020. They can see it on my website. So after they've read the, the free ebook, if they want to further explore, they could uh, try my book as well, which is also available on my website. So silenceteaches.com is the best place to find me, learn about Centering Prayer. And if they want to follow me on social media, all the different icons are right there on my website, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, LinkedIn. If they want to follow me on any of those platforms, they can just click on the icon and, and, and follow me. Perfect. And you don't have to remember all that. I will put it in the show notes for you. So the website will be in there, links to his social media, all of those things will be right there in the show notes so that you're not like, was it silence teach? Was it silences teaches? Like, so you don't have to worry about all that. I will make sure that those are in the show notes for you. So is there anything that you would like to offer them to take things further with you or is the best place for them to start the ebook or what would you write? What would you like? Um, what, what would the action be that you would recommend? I would say come to my website because this is probably a practice that's new. Most people probably haven't heard of it, even though it's you know over 50 years old. I would just encourage them to come to the website, subscribe, and just read the sh this e the short ebook. Will take them five minutes or so to read, and then just try try centering prayer. You know, make it a point to say to do it. Make it the first thing you do in the morning, and even do it for one to five minutes. Try it for 30 days, and and see. You know how how it changes you and how it heals you. So that that would be a good starting point. Go to the website, get the ebook, and try silence for thirty days, first thing in the morning for one to five minutes, and and see what happens. Yes. Well, I'm gonna. I accept the challenge. I am going to do the centering prayer silence thirty day challenge starting in the morning. Tomorrow is. November the 9th. So to start, this is a great time for me to um, get centered and get prepared for next year. So Rich, thank you so much um, for being here. Thank you so much for being a part of this podcast. I appreciate that you found us. Um, I, I'm excited. I, if nobody else does this, I'm going to be doing this, but I encourage each of you to adopt this practice into your life. I just, I already know without, you know, even doing it myself, just listening to the foundation of it and listening to, you know, to how it works. I really do believe that it will be transformative um, in your life and will help you get to your next level of destiny. So Rich, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you.
No, thanks for having me on. Hopefully it was helpful for your community and they can feel free to reach out to me. I have a contact page too. So if they have any questions, I love to interact. So I'm happy to interact with them via email or even a quick phone call or a Zoom call. So thanks for having me on. Yes, you're welcome. And everyone, thank you so much for listening to this episode of a Godship podcast. I pray that you will share it with others and that you will listen to past and future episodes as well. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.